So I want to give a brief introduction to the commons uh, and what, it's, what some of its implications might be for what, what uh, ESIP is involved with. And I, especially, of course, in scholarly and scientific commoning. And to start this discussion, we have to, first of all, get beyond the tragedy of the commons, which is the ubiquitous truism peddled by most economists, politicians, and policymakers that any shared resource is inevitably overexploited and ruined. Uh, we, start, we start because uh, the commons is generally invisible. It's generally seen that the state and the market are the only consequential forms of power and governance of getting things done, and that the relationships mandated by both are the only meaningful ones or practical ones. I'd like to suggest otherwise. Uh, Garrett Hardin was the biologist who started this uh, idea, or, or well, let's just say repopularized it in 1968 in a famous science journal article called The Tragedy of the Commons. And it basically said that, as I said, if you have a past, he told a fable of uh, if you have pa cattle or sheep on a commons, no single uh, farmer will have the motive to withhold its use of it, and inevitably it'll be overexploited. But this was really kind of a fable that was not supported by the empiricism of actual commons worldwide. And it, it contained a lot of embedded uh, assumptions. As my friend Lewis Hyde pointed out, it's really the tragedy of the unmanaged, laissez-faire common pool resources with easy access for non-communicated, self-interested individuals. Now, that's generally not unpacked when we talk about the tragedy, but that's really what his worldview and presumption was. I live in Amherst, Massachusetts, and we, we solve it quite simply. There's a sign, no horses on the common, and it solves the problem of the tragedy quite easily. But uh, more seriously, it was Eleanor Ostrom, who was an Indiana University political scientist who spent her career studying commons throughout the world, especially natural resource commons in rural, poorer countries, who demonstrated through exhaustive field work and creative theorizing that the commons is an entirely sustainable, functional model for governing shared resources. She won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for this work. I think significantly, uh, as a woman, she was more aware of the role of relationality and cooperation in economic behavior, which the, the profession is generally not attuned to. And it was also the year after the 2008 fiscal crisis where they wanted somebody with just a different take, you might say, on economics. She uh, is chiefly known for uh, identifying key design principles for successful commons. And I won't go through these all, but these are more guidelines rather than a blueprint, but they tend to be present for successful management of commons. Now, she was studying natural resource commons, so the dynamics are somewhat different in uh, digital commons. Uh, I might add that she was working within the rational actor economistic framework, and I think that that's something that some of us in the digital world and other types of commons are starting to move beyond to get into the intersubjective and social dimensions of commoning more than she did. She wasn't oblivious to that, of course, but it was not the primary focus given the rational actor framework. And I just want to point out that the commons really is understudied. There's an estimated 2 billion subsistence commoners around the world who depend upon forest, fisheries, uh, wild game, water, and so forth for their everyday life. But this is not really considered significant by standard economics because uh, there's no cash being exchanged or there's no market activity or even private property rights necessarily. Uh, yet, it's meeting very important needs in arguably more ecologically sustainable ways. There's things like seed sharing commons in uh, India. Uh, in, there's a potato park in Peru where numerous indigenous tribes have stewardship rights over the agroecological biocultural heritage zone that they have, which is preserving more than 900 different species of potatoes, a very uh, unique situation in the world. There's uh, interesting convergences between uh, management of natural resources and digital world. There, there's a whole system for rice intensification where farmers uh, in an open source, fa source fashion in India, Sri Lanka, Cuba, uh, and beyond collaborate online to trade agronomy practices to improve yields of rice. And it's been far superior to many of the interventionist uh, 
monoculture, GMO-based types of agriculture. So there's a great deal of diversity of commons around the world. There's growing interest in various ways uh, from scholarship, law, even commons as a new form of development. The Global South is understanding how it's a way for reconceptualizing their own uh, self-emancipation from a lot of pernicious trade treaties, investment treaties. And there's a whole world of activist movements going on, especially in Europe uh, and somewhat here. Now, one important reason for talking about the commons is you can talk about enclosures. Now, enclosures are the commodification, the privatization of resources, and really the dispossession from the community so that they have to become market players as opposed to collectively managing it. And needless to say, this also ignores the context. It basically decontextualizes the resource from the context, often with very harmful ecological results. And sometimes the state is quite active in collaborating with market forces to essentially dispossess the commoners. So there's uh, the market state, as I call it, likes to socialize the costs and risks through the government, but then allow the privatization of profits, which is precisely how various industries have uh, emerged and grown, uh, often at the expense of common shared resources. Uh, currently, there's a massive enclosure movement going on around the world in all sorts of different arenas. There's a huge international land grab going on for uh, in Asia and Latin America and, and uh, Africa, where hedge funds and sovereign investment funds are taking over lands that have been tr traditionally managed. A fifth of the human genome is now privately owned through patents, uh, which often can impede new research because you don't want to trip over somebody else's patent or get sued for it. There's actually, there's a book called Math You Can't Use because if certain algorithms are embedded in, pat, in uh, software, uh, you would violate uh, th that, those person's property rights. So there's actually mathematics being enclosed. And there's many other arenas we could go into where uh, the marketization of resources is uh, foreclosing other types of management regimes and, and solutions. So what I'd like to argue today is that the commons is no tragedy. It's a generative vehicle for managing resources and social communities. And we have to make the shift from the commons as a resource or an unowned resource to the commons as a social practice. As historian Peter Leinbau points out, there is no commons without commoning. It's a social practice, a, tra a traditions and rituals and norms and other social activities and cultural activities that create it, the way Bruce was talking about in terms of festivals. Uh, it's a community space. So we need to see commons uh, as really commoning, the a verb, not the noun, and we need to see it's about re relationality. Uh, and this helps shift our understanding of what a commons is and what it can do. And I'd just like to mention a few realms, domains, where the commons is really reinventing um, how things are done. We see the relocalization of food movement uh, popping up, not just in the global south, but around the, uh, in, in Europe and the US, many industrialized countries. We see new efforts, especially in Europe, to treat the city as a commons, not as something for investors and the affluent, but something that every citizen of the city has certain entitlements. And so there's a number of initiatives that I mentioned there which are trying to reconceptualize how cities are managed and developed. There's a whole movement of alternative currencies that are trying to allow com uh, communities to capture value instead of it being siphoned away to the fiat currencies or the global uh, capitalism. The web itself, I consider a hosting infrastructure for commons, which uh, has very low barriers to access uh, for self-organized sharing of resources. And that's one, indeed one reason why it's been so incredibly uh, creative and productive because of that capacity. We see that in the open source software explosion, which has just created so much value uh, in defiance of conventional economic logic. And we now see a second and third stage of this through open source design, hardware, and production through all sorts of different projects. FarmHack is creating all sorts of modular, cheaply sourceable uh, agricultural equipment. The WikiSpeed car, uh, open source community has created that, and, and many others are just taking this to new limits. 
And in academic research and learning, there's all sorts of initiatives as well to try to reclaim academic and research and learning from the forces of enclosure, especially from a lot of corporate university relationships and patents, which are not entirely so healthy to research collaboration and sharing. The point of all this is that commons is a generative and regenerative paradigm that opens up new solution sets. Instead of having the tyranny of certain business models that serve the competitive interests of certain companies or industries, uh, or having top-down bureaucratic administration, which is often rigid, not flexible, not aware of local knowledge or context, the commons opens up different ways of approaching these kinds of questions. But, and here's a big but, the generativity of the commons must be actively supported and protected. Uh, there, this this is a, a slide is about beating the bounds, where in medieval times there was a tradition where the community had an annual party where they would walk the perimeter of their commons, and if anybody had put up a fence or uh, a hedge to enclose the commons for private purposes, they would knock it down. And this was a way of both protecting the commons as well as acculturating everyone, all the commoners of their shared wealth that belonged to them. So we need analogous ways of beating the bounds today, the way Creative Commons licenses do or a lot of open source, general, or the general public license does for software. We need ways of technology, law, and social practice to protect the value created by the commons. And this suggests that we need to move beyond the openness paradigm, which is a huge emancipation over the past, but not necessarily quite there in terms of providing the stewardship or protection of the shared wealth. So I think that's really the frontier challenge that we face today. But this notion of commoning requires an ontological shift in how we think about social practices, norms, and value, meaning, it has to come from the bottom up. In the way Bruce was talking about emergent organizations, it has to be rooted in the social practice, experience, and identity of people, and not try superimposed in artificial or bureaucratic ways, or for that matter, market ways, from on high. So this is really uh, gets into difficult territory when you talk about changing culture. I like to see the commons as a different universe of value that is not economistic, but more social. And it, it, it respects and honors these types of values of fairness and responsibilities linked to entitlements. And inalienability, meaning things are not necessarily accessible to the market or, mon or for monetization. People have bottom-up rulemaking. They, they make the rules themselves that are, as are appropriate for the resource and the circumstances. And there's long-term stewardship, meeting basic needs before market needs and custom and tradition having a value. So as you can see, this is a different universe than the reduce everything to a price and uh, price being the, the sole token of information about value. Another way of looking about it is the commons as a world-making enterprise. Uh, in other words, it's engaging the entire human being in all of their aspirations and needs beyond simply being a market player for competitive advantage or profit making. And I, I find this a very uh, good explanation for why the commons are so persistent and even um, attractive to so many people, because they meet our fuller spectrum of needs as human beings. But once we get into this territory, some of the familiar dualities of modern life and the enlightenment start to intrude. The rational and the non-rational start to blur. The objective and the subjective, the collective and the individual, the public and the private those categories are not as operative, uh, which is confusing to a lot of people who try, try to revert to some of those dualisms, which I don't believe are truly functional in most commons. And one way I tried to illustrate this is uh, to show, I, I, uh, I once saw a slide where somebody presented the, this map of the great sandy desert as seen by the moderns, us, uh, perfectly logical, but of course, the indigenous people see that same territory as that. And the point is, commoning is a subjective social expression of relationships to each other and to our resources. We have affective, affective labor that we honor in a commons. Uh, and so that's why uh, some of this is kind of confounding, I think, to a lot of us as we start to get into the commons. <clears throat> 
Now, the question might be, if everything's so subjective and idiosyncratic and not universalistic and you know, normative in a, this universal grid, the way science often presumes, what heuristic can help us understand the commons? And uh, my colleagues and I have, have uh, were quite inspired by Christopher Alexander and his notion of pattern languages. He was a, uh, you might say, a renegade architect and urban designer who wanted to know why do certain patterns and spaces of architecture and urban space persist over centuries or even millennia? Why are they so um, enduring? And his answer was that they, they answer to certain inner needs of human beings uh, in different ways. There, there'll be a certain problem that is invariant over time that defines the problem, and then certain patterns that are not identical, but meet the problem within their, their specific context. And the idea of patterns as a way of honoring the actual diversity of life, but having a certain unit, unified uh, quality through the pattern is a way of reconciling the pluralistic and the unitary. And I think that this is one of, uh, you might say, epistemological way of understanding how a commons works. My colleague, uh, Silke Helfrich, who's a German policy and uh, policy activist, and I did this book on patterns of commoning precisely to try to tease out how patterns apply to how commons work. And this is a book of uh, several dozen successful commons around the world in different regions, different uh, resource domains to show how diverse uh, commoning actually is. Now, let me just close with this section about commons governance, which I think a lot of us are on the cusp of in the digital world and many other areas. How do we think about governance, especially if we come from a modern context and not from a traditional subsistence or indigenous context where we might have a tradition for this. I think this is an under-theorized realm where we don't really know. We just have a lot of suggestive, compelling examples. But I think the first step is we have to think less about the resource than the social system and practices. And the Ostrom principles are a great place to start because they're, they've proven their uh, explanatory value over time in diverse contexts. But I think we have the advantage that we can devise tech platforms that enable new affordances to allow different types of social governance to emerge. So needless to say, this will not be a, a typical hierarchical administrative structure. It will be more of a network, uh, open source style uh, system of governance. And I'd like to mention a handful, of, a handful of sectors where there's some really interesting experimentation going on with these models. One is uh, this new, relatively new movement, only a year or two old, called platform cooperativism, where they're trying to devise platforms that will compete successfully with the uh, Ubers and the Airbnbs by having a cooperative rather than a Silicon Valley, one might say, extractive or predatory business model. Uh, the Internet of Ownership is one website where they're keeping track of the varieties, and there's a number of conferences internationally on this topic. Another interesting area is there's some network-based deliberation, collaboration, and governance platforms that have emerged. Inspiral is a New Zealand, uh, you might say, guild that combines uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity with social mission. And they created Lumio, which is a, a fascinating new deliberative uh, platform where communities can come together, make proposals, have serious deliberations, and, and then decide things in very efficient ways uh, among dispersed communities. There's a whole new set of open value networks which are trying to develop different metrics for measuring the contributions of different participants. Uh, and Liquid Democracy is another platform for decision making that the pirate parties in Europe have devised to try to allow uh, diverse participation as well as avoiding the co-optation of typical representational leadership. There's also some other new platforms for self-organized commons that seem to be emerging. Ethereum is one such platform. The blockchain that undergirds uh, Bitcoin is, uh, there's a lot of innovation experimentation going on there, some of which people are trying to devise what they call digital autonomous organizations, DAOs, which would be basically online communities held together uh, 
by the infrastructure of their software, but over time by the social commitments and contributions of their members. These are all, you might say, a borning. They're not mature at all, but they seem filled with a lot of possibility and promise. Uh, one standby model for a lot of this governance is the open source software foundations, which many or many or most major open source communities also have affiliated foundations who are run by the elders of the community who help insulate uh, the community from market pressures, but still provide financial support to strategic projects. And then I'm, I, I've recently uh, learned a lot from my friend Dave Jackie, who's a permaculture expert who's talked about how ecosystems can give us guidance on how governance can work. He talks about ecosystem guilds for symbiotic sharing that occur in nature, where you'll have community function guilds, for example, where everyone in a species all serves the community needs, and this helps uh, provide for a certain resilience and stability. Or there's resource partitioning guilds where uh, different species will allocate access to a, a limited resource, you know, perhaps uh, some soil nutrient by time, space, or kind. They'll work out arrangements. Uh, and then you see mutual support guilds where there'll be functional interconnections with people with different needs and different yields. Uh, I find this probably the most similar to the open source world. But suffice it to say, these are certain guideposts that we might look to as we try to theorize more intelligently about governance of, uh, of human commons. So let me just close with why a commons for research and data? I think to assure greater sovereignty of control by the co-creators uh, so that it's not simply appropriated by others, be it, uh, be it uh, especially the market, I should say, which is, likes to have free or discounted access to a value created by someone else. Commons can help unleash a lot of creative social and scientific energies, again, similar to the festival logic that Bruce was describing. It helps reduce costs by mutualization and pooling. It promotes a sense of fairness and transparency and therefore a willingness to contribute because you know that your contribution will be honored and protected by the community and not simply siphoned away. And I think the language of the commons itself, itself gives us a shared discourse we're talking about self-governance and coordination and how we share benefits. So these are one various reasons why I think the Commons uh, has a, a strong future in helping to reimagine and uh, consolidate a lot of the existing collaborations going on in the research world. So I thank you for your attention on this, and uh, I'd love to talk about commenting, commenting with more of you now or in the break. Thank you. I think uh, questions, right? One or two questions, okay. and uh, and yes, good, Brian. Stop taking this off the microphone thing. I'm realizing. Sorry, um, Brian Wee from Neptune and Company, an environmental risk assessment firm. My question has actually two parts. About you know, one is related to the physical commons, and the other part is related to the virtual commons. The virtual commons meaning data information that you referred to. Now, so on the physical commons part of it, um, I think social ecological systems, as you had mentioned in an earlier part in your talk. But so the question here with the physical commons is: What are your thoughts about the interaction of um, uh, scale, especially? physical scale, maybe if you want to comment on temporal scale, uh, any constraints that scale imposes on how far you can stretch the concept of a commons, that's for the physical commons. On the virtual commons, like data and information, the question would be uh, on authority. And, and, and here I'm thinking specifically of a, a topic that a lot of us in this room work on, which is climate. Um, and, and so, you know, the whole issue about misinformation out there uh, will arise when you think about commons. So uh, th those are the two parts, physical commons and scale and uh, virtual commons and authority. Well, I consider scale uh, a word that is part of the hierarchical era. And yes, we do need to expand the scope of commoning, but I think it's going to occur through not a hierarchical unitary structure, but through replication and federation so that the appropriate scale is kept, yet you can still have a broader scope of activity for it. 
in, without it being centrally corrected and centrally controlled through command and control, which I might add is highly susceptible to corruption or lack of trust and legitimacy. So which I think is one of the more serious institutional problems of our time. So I, I think that uh, there are new models that have not yet emerged, but we've seen a lot of suggestive possibilities of bottom-up emergence in federation. I, I once wrote a speculative essay about this topic for Friends of the Earth UK called Transnational Republics of Commoning, Reinventing Governance Through Emergent Networking. And I think that sort of is where I'm headed in thinking about this, as opposed to finding some uber uh, global institution that will not be able to reconcile differences, honor pluralism, honor local knowledge and diversity and so forth. So that's where I come on that. As far as, what was the other question? So the virtual commons and the issue of uh, authority, authoritative sources of information in, in, in a commons, um, Con, uh, in, in, in the concept of a commons, how, how do you how do you how, how do you cope with issues about uh, misinformation and everybody claiming that they are the experts? Well, that's so. that's one reason why I think the move from open to commons is important because an open space is not curated, the uh, warranting for truth or reliability is not made. But if you have stewardship and curation among a known community, as opposed to simply an open network, you can start to develop trust, legitimacy and know who you're dealing with. And I think that part of that's an infrastructure problem, that we need new systems for identity and authenticity of the participants of a commons, which uh, there are a number of software systems that are aspiring to solve this problem. Uh, but that would go a long way towards helping us move from open platforms, which are not necessarily reliable, but can aggregate information in very efficient ways, to a commons which can have the benefits of an open network but also greater trustworthiness and legitimacy. So I'm, that's an abstract explanation, but I do see a lot of existing projects heading in those directions. Thank you. I have one more, but you're gonna be here all of I'll be here this afternoon. Good. Good. Thank you for an inspiring talk. Uh, in this last presidential campaign, I thought that some of, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, ideas of making our healthcare system and our public colleges as a, a way of sort of taking these spaces back into the into the commons, um, and I think that the American public reacted more with like fear of what's going to be lost uh, rather than inspired by what could be gained by that. Well, I think you're right. There's a lot of legitimate fear about centralized socialism, which I think did fail. And I think there's a difference between government management of collective systems and bottom-up and locally and regionally appropriate systems. And I think that's partly a shift that even the Bernie Sanders of the world have not made to. Uh, they're neo-Keynesians who would focus on state power and policy and law as the drivers of this, as opposed to bottom-up self-organization that's pluralistic inherently. So it's a different mindset. Uh, but I do think there's a great deal of promise. I do think the state can play a very important role in terms of infrastructure and facilitating, but it should be the partner state as opposed to the directive or command and control state. That's why I'm asking about people's uh, reaction fear. Oh, the, yeah, so I think that a lot of the backlash of our time is precisely the, the fear and distrust of centralized institutions that have been corrupted. And I think that's partly not a political or ideological issue, but a functional issue of large uh, bureaucracies and systems that purport to manage you know, a, a continent of activity. And I just don't think that's functional, uh, in, especially in the networked world, where so much autonomy burbles up from the bottom. Uh, 